Good morning. Good morning. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Excellent. Uh, we ran out of our, our color copies of the bulletin. They are printing off some extra copies back there. So if you are sharing and during the midst of our Christian service, you feel like you've done enough sharing and you need your own, uh, there'll be a bulletin back there in just a few minutes for you to get your own. Uh, we want no one to leave unhappy here, okay? Uh, so our service is printed out in the bulletin. We rise for our first hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore we are here. Since we are gathered together to hear God's Word, to call upon Him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our own unworthiness, and confess before God and before one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from this, our sinful condition. Together as His people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you. For His sake He forgives you all your sins. 
As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord is my strength and my song. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength and your holy love. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your love. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. Almighty God, the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with the joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the resurrection of our Lord is from Isaiah chapter 65. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. 
No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and, an, and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most, not, most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all will die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, after destroying every rule in every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While well, they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who, with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. 
He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We invite the children to come forward now for the children's message. Good morning. You guys look beautiful. Now, for the last 40 days, there's a word we haven't been saying. What word is it? Alleluia. Alleluia. So we haven't been saying Alleluia. And today, it comes bursting back out, right? How many times have we said hallelujah so far today? I don't know. A bunch, haven't we? I didn't count. And there's more to come. And we have our hallelujah banner. Because today is a day of joy and praise to God. Oh, did your belt come off? Oh, okay. Well, that's a good thing to deal with it. So... Hallelujah is a Hebrew word, and it comes from two parts, okay? So the first part, Hallel, means praise, right? You know what the second part is? That's God's name, the first part of God's name, Yah. Yah. Did you know that the Jews never said God's name? Because in the Bible, it says, you shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, and they said, well, we don't want to even come close to using God's name in vain, so we'll just never use it. Now, hold on a second. Do you think that's what God wanted? When he said, don't use my name in vain, did he mean never call Michael Michael? What if I never called him Michael? I just said, hey, you, kid, buddy. Would that get annoying to you? Would, it, would you like me to use your name sometimes? Kid? Little guy? <laughs> Not for long. Not for long. Yeah. But when we, there's a way when we use somebody's name that we show, that we notice them, that we respect them, that we love them, right? Nate? Yeah? Right, Michael? Yeah. And so for 40 days, we haven't been saying that part of God's name, Yah, Allelu, Yah. But today, it comes back. And, you know, every one of the commandments, on the one hand, it tells me don't do something. But on the other hand, it tells me do something. So, on the one hand, when the Bible tells me not to steal, I'm not supposed to take 
hand his hat, right? <laughs> but I'm supposed to help her keep it and protect it, right? So if the commandment says don't use the Lord's name in vain, how do we keep that commandment? We use God's name how? In praise and thanksgiving. So today, when we say, Alleluia, we are keeping the commandment. When we have that praise in our heart, we give thanks, we have joy for all he's done, that is the right way to use God's name. And what a thing that God says, you can call me by name. He says, when you pray, you can call me Father. And we know God's name even better because he sent his son. And what's his son's name? Jesus. And we could call on him as Jesus. And not just, hey, guy. Right? So let's pray. Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we give thanks that you've shown us who you are, that you've defeated death, and you've put that word into our mouth with joy and hope and praise. Alleluia. We sing Alleluia to you in wonder and thanksgiving for all you give to us. Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen. All right. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Thank you, guys. You can get a children's bulletin from Gabe, and we'll sing our next hymn. Don't forget this.
grace, peace, and mercy to you from the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For the days of a tree shall be the days of my people be. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Our text from Isaiah, he prophesied to a people who had been taken into captivity, tragically. People who saw all that they had built either destroyed or taken into the hands of an invader. And Isaiah promised God would replant his people. They would rise again. Isaiah said still more that this resurrection of Israel, come back from captivity, it is a picture of a grander miracle still to come. The Lord will make all things new. And we are blessed to live in that age in which the apostles' message has gone out and we know what Isaiah meant in Christ. God sent his son into the world. The word made flesh suffered far worse terror than even those exiles suffered. Jesus' very life was taken from him. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. See, this is not just good news for Jesus. He is risen. But Jesus' apostles teach us that the Lord is the first fruit of a greater resurrection yet to come. So that all those who we have lost in this life and we mourn, whether they were cut down too soon, or we watched them take those hard, long steps on a lengthy journey. Every one of those will rise again. And we will rise again. But alongside that promise of eternal life, beginning on the last day, Paul, he owns that we who expect to be united with Christ in his resurrection, we will be united with Christ in cross-bearing. Jesus had said it himself, that anyone who wants to follow him must take up his cross in order to follow him. So Paul says, look, if the bodily resurrection of Jesus is not true, then those who follow are most to be pitied. Are most to be pitied. When we mentioned on Good Friday that Paul, of course, is right. His words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet there's still something substantial, something glorious, something ruggedly true, even in those darkest and hardest moments of cross-bearing, when you find love given to you to give to others in those moments. It is better to love under the cross than not to have loved. And we must caution ourselves. Because ever since Paul, Christians might be the most to be pitied should our faith have been mistaken. Well, there have been many people offering up alternative takes on Christianity, their own brands of pity-free Christianity. A pity-free, crossless Christianity sounds like the way to go. To be honest, Jesus' first apostles all tried it. When they came and arrested Jesus, they said, okay, we're skipping town. We're not sticking around for the cross. And Peter, who was called the rock, he denied Jesus in triplicate. But just like the exiles under Isaiah, God regathered those scattered sheep. He brought the apostles back. Jesus forgave every one of them. And those apostles did carry the cross. Eleven were martyred. And the only one who wasn't, they tried to martyr him. They tried a couple times. When it wouldn't take, they just exiled him to get him off the way. And it's great evidence for the truth of the resurrection. If they made it up, or if they still harbored doubts like Thomas did before he saw and put his fingers in the wounds, would they have all died in those ways? And we don't pity them. Rightly, we celebrate them because they loved to the end and they had the victory in Christ Jesus. But since then, there are Christians who've tried following Jesus like a husband follows whatever his wife is saying during the last couple minutes of a fourth quarter football game that's tied. We might laugh about it, but if you think about what I'm talking about, it's kind of sad. 
than a voice a husband used to thrill to hear, to say, this is the one person I want to hear from more than any. The voice of love, kind of not interested in right now. Could you just wait, honey? And that's how we are with Christ sometimes. Yet in the book of Revelation, he warns us that if we go lukewarm on him, he's going to spit us out of his mouth. It doesn't work that way. It's either all in or out, brothers and sisters. It's not the only pity-free Christianity man has tried to invent. We've, we've come up with a, a few variations. There's the kind that takes up Isaiah's words in the Old Testament, cuts off the part about new creation. We'll just get rid of the word new. We'll have it right here, right now. We'll get our treasures now. If we're going to get our treasures now, we're going to treat prayer like a, a vending machine. Just teach me the right words, pastor, and then I'll get exactly what I want. And I'll get my treasures now. And if we're getting our treasures now, we're going to need armies to protect those treasures. Whether soldiers or lawyers or both. We've got to fight for this kingdom here in this world. We'll use these words crusade, but we're not talking about something from the Middle Ages. We're talking about today. We've been told, Christians, it's time to stop being pitied in this world. We don't want to be pitied. Nobody wants to be pitied. It's time to stop being sheep and start being lions. Well, there's only one lion of the tribe of Judah. The one lion of the tribe of Judah, he chose to become the Lamb of God. And if you're stronger than him, too strong to be one of his sheep, it's not the Bible's Christianity you're practicing. If you want in on biblical Christianity, brothers and sisters, and you do, you want in on biblical Christianity because, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He's yes. risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, then we're going to have to risk being pitied with Paul. Not just pitied by fools, but if in this life we only have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. I'm seeing more and more rebellion among Christians against what Paul and Jesus' 12 apostles lived. Christians tell each other, don't be a doormat. Yeah, I can agree in one way with that. You aren't called to be a doormat to just take it. We have a clear and active response that we've been commanded to do in response to people treating us wrongly. And see, the don't be a doormat talk, well, not always, but often it's upset about the very pity that Paul is talking about. The turning the other cheek. The choosing to go forward and being a peacemaker. It's often a rejection of that command from Jesus who said, you're going to have to take up a cross to follow me. The promise that our blessings in this life come from being peacemakers. In some mouths, it even becomes a slander of what we're trying to do when we turn the other cheek. When by God's grace, we actually have the strength. Because a lot of times I don't have the strength for it, right? Lord, forgive us. But when God's grace gives us the strength to turn the other cheek, to make peace with an enemy, we are doing something wonderful. Something glorious. It's not being a doormat. It's standing firm to love. Turning the other cheek cuts against instincts that are in the deepest fibers of our bodies, right? When somebody does something bad, the animal part of us says, fight or flight. And that's all we think, if thinking's even the right word, right? Being human, we don't do it just like the animals. Well, we've got complicated ways to do it because we're human, right? Sometimes the fight is with my words. I yell, I scream. Sometimes the flight, I don't move my legs at all. I just kind of disappear and don't say anything. But Christ has shown us a different way. It's what Isaiah prophesied too. A way of standing ground and saying, you're not going to stop me from loving. I'm going to keep doing it. 
whatever cross is put on my shoulders for doing it. I'm going to keep trying to make peace. Whatever you think you're going to do to stop me, I'm not going to stop. Because even if I go as far as Christ went on his cross, I know who's won. I know who's victorious. Isaiah said, for like the days of a tree shall my people be. We need to get planted in God's word and stand firm in this love. See, remember when Jesus was attacked, at any moment he could have said, I know I've laid aside my glory and my power. I'm going to pick it up for just one second, okay? Because that guy mocking me on the cross, he's really annoying. And we're going to go God mode on him for just a second. All the rest I'm going to forgive. But that guy, he's really got it coming to him. And he can look the other way and just pretend it's not him throwing the lightning bolt. Making the guy pop. He could have done that at any moment. He's got another way. That's the fight. The flight. Jesus could have just said, okay, I tried being a human. They didn't like it. Let's do the angel thing instead. Let's kind of become an angel instead of a human. Let's slough off the humanity. Leave them. Let them do what they want with that ball. We'll make another creation. He didn't do either one of those things. The cross, you see, is Jesus refusing to flee, refusing to fight in the way that we fight, because he insisted he would just keep loving. He stood his ground and loved. And he loved with every ounce of his being to his very last breath, no matter how much it hurt. And did it work? See, that's the great question. Did it work? I tell you, on the one hand, if we're going to pity anyone, because Paul says we're the most to be pitied only if we're wrong, what if we're right? What if it worked? Then the one who stopped loving for whatever reason, that's the one to be pitied. Love is what we are made for. It's what our hearts long to have in full. That's why we crave forgiveness, because we know how many opportunities we've missed and skipped that we don't get back to have loved and done it right. And so thanks be to God that Jesus' resurrection is God's great amen to the prayer of Christ from the cross, where he was loving with such strength that he could say to those mocking him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Father raised him up to say, Amen. They are forgiven. You are forgiven. We are forgiven. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He's yes. risen indeed. Amen. So did it work? Did refusing fight, refusing flight, choosing to stand ground and love, did it work? Did Jesus loving with every ounce of his being, refusing those two options that our bodies tell us are the only options, did it make it possible for the wolf to lie down with the lamb, for them to graze together? And we can sift through the evidence. We have the change in the flight-prone disciples who learn to stay and not to fight in the earthly way, but to stay in love to their ends. And we have the fruit that we see in the brothers and sisters when we persevere in the life of the church together. And we see God growing his saints in this place. And brothers and sisters, we may not always see it in ourselves as we grow in understanding our own sinfulness, but your brothers and sisters see it of you. They see how you grow by God's grace. And we have the fact that all around the world today, there's a victory cry that is echoing in every language and every tribe and every nation. It is the victory cry we say, Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And we didn't accomplish this by the sword. We tried that. It did not work. We accomplished that by praying by praising, by standing our ground and loving. So for you, brother and sister, for you to avoid the fight or the flight, it takes faith. Fight, flight, faith. 
You need to believe that Christ is victorious. And that when you feel that you are standing there on ground that is falling away and no one else is with you because it feels that way, that you know Christ is with you. And that he's not with you in a, we'll see what happens kind of way. He's with you in a, he is victorious way. You need to believe that on the throne right now is not a Christ that's withdrawn from the world and said, that was no fun, glad I'm back up here. But one who said, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. You need to believe that it's not a lion who says, let me at him on crusade, on the throne. But on the throne is the lamb who was slain. And that is how he rules. As the lamb who was slain. That image, that hope, that truth will strengthen you to stand your ground and love deeper than you thought possible. Even through grief of death roaring its roar. Even through people who just keep mocking and never seem to respond to your prayer, Father, forgive them. Because you aren't standing alone and loving. When you choose to sow the seeds of peace, you are the Lord's hands for his harvest that must prove true. You aren't a lemming, you aren't a doormat, you aren't defeated. Even should they take every last right, even should they crow that they've rewritten the history books, even should they win every last mess of porridge of this world, let them have it. Because we aren't hoping in this world. We're just loving this world to its bitter end. And not our end. Not the end of anything that is loved with this redemptive love. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered. This is the church's mission. In Isaiah's word, hundreds of years before we are here today, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. To be a joy. That's part of how we stand and love. Refusing to let our joy be taken, no matter what other grumbling comes into our heart in the moment, we say no. Because Christ is risen. And God is making all things new. And the things that seem to be so permanent today, they will not be remembered. God himself says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem. I will be glad in my people. So we too. We will stand. We will love. We will rejoice in God's people, celebrating together with one Hopeful voice, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise to pray. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Lord God, on this glorious day, fill your people with a holy fear at the resurrection of your Son, that we would tremble no longer before the grave, but rejoice and live in the truth of your power to save. Lord, in your mercy. Be with Matthew, our synod president, Daniel, our district president, and all our pastors. Keep them faithful to deliver your people the apostolic gospel of your son's death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, let us hold fast to the word preached to us, that receiving it with joy, we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Hinder all who would sow doubt into our hearts and grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversation. Lord, in your mercy, bless Joseph, our president, Andy, our governor, David, our mayor, and all who make and administer our laws. Frustrate the forces of evil. Do not let our leaders cooperate with them or further their goals. Guard our armed forces as they stand watch for us at home and abroad. Let them serve with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need, especially those we remember in our hearts in this moment. 
Let the dawning light of the new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. In accord with your will, grant them renewed health, a foretaste of the eternal healing in him. Lord, in your mercy, give us joy in your son's great victory feast as he shares it with us from this altar. And the eating of his true body and the drinking of his precious blood in faith overcome our sin by his forgiveness and swallow up our death in his life that we may be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Lord, in your mercy, comfort those who mourn with the truth of Christ's empty tomb that in the midst of their grief they may abide in the hope of his resurrection. Uphold them in faith as they await the day when you will wipe away every tear from all faces. Lord, in your mercy, we join today in singing eternal alleluias with innumerable angels in festal gathering, with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he's now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Lord. 
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And by his death he has redeemed us from the bondage to sin and death. And by his resurrection he has delivered us into new life in him. Grant us to keep the feast in sincerity and truth, faithfully eating his body given into death and drinking his life's blood poured out for our salvation till we pass through death to the promised land of life eternal. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
God, our Heavenly Father. You have given us a foretaste of the feast to come, the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage. But on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and give you His peace. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia.
ask the congregation to be seated. We have a few last words to say today. Uh, a week like this, there's a lot that uh, happens, and there are a lot of people that help make it happen. And so uh, I think what I want to do is to thank the Lord that there are too many people to thank. Uh, <laughs> there are so many of you who have not only done things this week, but there are those of you who have served for years and years in this congregation to set groove lines that make things go smoothly. So thank you to all, and thanks be to the Lord who provides for his church. Thank you to Lori for playing. It's good to have Lori and David here with us this week. I also know there is a contest that we haven't done this before. Uh, so it was uh, Don and Donna wanted to make sure that every age group had something going on this Easter that was for them. And so we have a hat contest. Is that right, Don? So there's only the, the ladies who are over 18 are eligible for this hat contest. We had to keep the young boys out of this contest, right? So, Don, do we have a winner of the Easter Bonnet co contest? Suzanne Rutledge, congratulations. Do we need to check? Are you over 18? <laughs> Congratulations, Suzanne. I want to thank everybody that had that tremendous breakfast this morning. Yeah. That was awesome. It was a great breakfast. Yesterday, Mike won the Wild Egg Podcast. Suzanne won the. They're cleaning up. So, Greg, you need to step it up. Suzanne. Yeah? He just show off his hat. All right. If this happens again next year, I think we're going to see it stepped up a little bit. Got movable Easter bunnies around the brim of the hat. Maybe some fireworks. Thank you, Donna. Anybody else have any other announcements they want to bring to our attention? God's blessings on your week, and one last time. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen.